Have you heard of sleep inertia and how it can impact your performance as a pilot? And what about false glide slopes? Do you know how and where you might encounter them while flying an instrument approach? Both of these phenomena played a key role in the fatal crash of an Air India Express 737, and we'll talk about how these factors can affect you as a GA pilot. Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation. My name is Max Truscott. I've been flying for, yeah, 50 years. I'm the author of several books and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. And my mission is to help you become the safest possible pilot. Last week, we talked about the crash of a business jet in Hot Springs, Virginia. And I read some of your feedback on the Houston incident in which United Flight 2477 went into the grass. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 320. And if you're new to the show, welcome. Great to have you here. But if you would, take a moment right now and touch either the subscribe key or if you're using the Apple Podcast app, the follow key, so that next week's episode is downloaded for free. And let me remind you that this is a listener-supported show, supported by longtime listeners like you. And we have several new ways that you can show your love and support for the show. So just head on out to our new support page at aviationnewstalk.com support where you'll find links to support the show via PayPal, Venmo, the Cash App, Zelle, and Patreon. And when you make a donation, I'll read your name on the show. Now, this show will be a little shorter than usual, as I'm still in Los Angeles at USC, where this week I've been taking the helicopter accident investigation course. Now, one of the highlights of this course was getting a factory tour of a Robinson helicopter, and I'll tell you about that in detail next week. Now, let's talk about sleep inertia and false glide slopes. First, the two are not related. They are separate phenomena, but we'll talk about them as they were both major factors in an Air India Express accident. Air India Express is a low-cost airline in India that started in 2005. They currently have 47 aircraft and fly to 45 destinations. Their goal was to provide short-haul international routes from India to the Middle East and Southeast Asia. While I was in the Human Factors course at USC last week, I learned about the airline's first fatal crash, Flight 812, which occurred in 2010. Although we usually talk here about GA crashes, I'm talking about this one as sleep inertia and false glide slopes are important topics that rarely get discussed in general aviation. Air India Express operates a Boeing 737 on a quick turnaround flight from Mangalore to Dubai and then back to Mangalore. The outbound flight to Dubai was uneventful. The aircraft was refueled and returned to India. The return flight was Flight 812. The cockpit voice recorder, which recorded the last two hours and five minutes of the conversation, indicated that there was no conversation between the two pilots for the first hour and 40 minutes, and that the captain was asleep with intermittent sounds of snoring and deep breathing. So from that, we can infer that the captain awakened about 25 minutes prior to the crash. Mangalore Airport has a tabletop runway that sits on a plateau because of the surrounding terrain, Air India Express has made a special qualification requirement that only the PIC can carry out the takeoff and landing. Thus, the captain was required to make the landing, even though the first officer had been there many times more than the captain. Normally, the aircraft would start its descent from flight level 370, about 130 miles from the airport. But the radar was out of service, and ATC didn't clear the aircraft to descend until just 77 miles from Mangalore. The visibility was 6 kilometers, or about 3.7 statute miles, and the aircraft was advised to fly the ILS DME arc approach for runway 24. According to the final report, the crew failed to plan the descent profile properly, and the aircraft was high and did not intercept the ILS glide slope from below, which is the standard procedure. This led to the aircraft being almost twice the altitude on final as compared to a standard ILS approach. In the ensuing unstabilized approach, the first officer gave three calls to the captain to go around. Now, one of my instructors at USC last week made an interesting comment about the crash. He said that sometimes in high-stress situations, because his focus has become so narrowed, a pilot might not even hear the other pilot say, go around. And he said that at his airline, after the second call for a go-around, the pilot calling for the go-around is required to take over and perform the go-around. He also said that if a pilot is not responding, you might hit them on the shoulder with the back of your hand to get their attention. According to the final report, there were a number of ground proximity warnings of sync rate and pull up, 
Despite these warnings and calls from the first officer to go around, the captain persisted with the approach in unstabilized conditions. Runway 24 is 2,450 meters long, which is a little over 8,000 feet. The final touchdown of the aircraft was at about 5,200 feet past the beginning of Runway 24, leaving only about 2,800 feet to the end of the paved surface in which to stop the aircraft. Soon after touchdown, the captain selected thrust reverser. After using the full reverser for 10 seconds, the captain initiated a rather delayed go-around or an attempted takeoff. In contravention to the Standard Operating Procedures, or SOP, laid down by the manufacturer Boeing. The aircraft overshot the runway, and its right wing impacted the ILS localizer antenna mounting structure. Thereafter, the aircraft hit the aircraft boundary fence and fell into a gorge. Due to impact and fire, the aircraft was destroyed. Sadly, 152 passengers and all six crew members lost their lives. There were only eight survivors. And I was surprised to learn from one of our instructors that once the throttle is in the idle detent position, it can take a full 17 seconds for Boeing 737 to get back to takeoff power, which is why a go-around was not permitted in this situation. The final report says that the direct cause of the accident, which in the U.S. we would call the probable cause, was the Court of Inquiry determines that cause of this accident was the captain's failure to discontinue the unstabilized approach and his persistence in continuing with the landing, despite three calls from the first officer to go around and a number of warnings from the ground proximity system. The contributory factors were a, in spite of the availability of adequate rest period prior to the flight, the captain was in prolonged sleep during the flight, which could have led to sleep inertia. As a result of relatively short period of time between his awakening and the approach, it possibly led to impaired judgment. This aspect might have become accentuated while flying in the window of circadian low, or WOCL. B, in the absence of Mangalore area control radar, due to unserviceability, the aircraft was given descent at a shorter distance on DME as compared to the normal. However, the flight crew did not plan the descent profile properly, resulting in remaining high in approach. C, probably in view of ambiguity in various instructions, empowering the co-pilot to initiate a go-around. The first officer gave repeated calls to this effect, but did not take over the controls to actually discontinue the ill-fated approach. Now, in a moment, I'll talk about some of the specific speeds and descent rates on the approach and about false glide slopes. But first, let's talk about sleep inertia. In discussing this, final report says, some of the airlines, such as Air Canada, allow controlled rest and seat in two-man cockpits like Boeing 737-800. Their SOP spells out a number of activities which must be completed prior to the rest period, such as transfer of flight duties, coordination with flight attendants, etc. The SOP also specifies that the rest period should be for a maximum of 45 minutes to avoid sleep inertia. Also, such controlled rest should be completed at least 30 minutes prior to planned top of descent. The Canadian Air Regulation also mentions that it takes about 15 minutes after awakening to be fully awake and take over the flight duties. The captain, therefore, may have suffered from conditions of sleep inertia, resulting into clouding of judgment. Possibly this was further affected by flying in the WOCL, or Window of Circadian Low. According to the FAA, circadian fatigue refers to the reduced performance during nighttime hours, particularly during an individual's WOCL, typically between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. Here's what the FAA says about sleep inertia in a 2012 newsletter called MX Fatigue, which I think stands for Maintenance Fatigue. It says, There is a potential disadvantage to on-shift napping, namely sleep inertia. This is the feeling of grogginess and the transiently degraded cognitive performance experienced immediately following awakening. It is generally considered to dissipate within about 30 minutes, after the end of a daytime nap. However, the duration of sleep inertia varies by the length of the nap. For example, a 30 to 50 minute nap may produce around 10 to 15 minutes of sleep inertia, whereas the duration of sleep inertia may be extended following longer naps. The intensity of sleep inertia is greater after naps taken at night than after naps taken during the day. Very brief naps of 10 minutes or less are usually not associated with sleep inertia, and may still improve performance for up to approximately 2.5 hours. Sleep inertia effects may be counteracted by caffeine. 
And from the FAA's AC120-100, it says, This sleep-related process causes a temporary degradation in performance immediately after awakening. The degradation or loss of alertness is dependent on depth of sleep at the time of awakening. The degradation dissipates after awakening on a time scale ranging from minutes to a few hours. Sleep inertia causes a feeling of drowsiness or lethargy and can be measured as a noticeable change in reaction time and potential for lapses in attention. The duration and severity of sleep inertia is related to the depth of sleep at the time of awakening. It tends to be greater after short sleep periods of an hour or two when the need for sleep is not fully satisfied or after sleep when the person is carrying a large sleep deficit from prior sleep restrictions. Note that the Air India Express captain was asleep for at least an hour and 40 minutes, so he was likely sleeping for this one to two hour period that produces the greatest levels of sleep inertia. And from a section called Why Naps Work, Sleep Homeostasis, it says, the effectiveness of napping can be understood on the basis of sleep homeostasis. This is a biological process that builds up a pressure for sleep during wakefulness and dissipates this pressure during sleep. This occurs in an exponential manner. As a consequence, most sleep pressure is dissipated in the beginning of a sleep period, making a brief nap disproportionately effective in reducing sleep pressure over the short term. And if you want to read more about fatigue, you may want to check out the FAA's AC 117-3. Now let's talk about false glide slopes, and let me first tell you a little about the altitudes at which the captain flew the ILS into Mangalore. According to the final report, the field elevation at Mangalore is 101.629 meters. Note that they include three digits to the right of the decimal point, meaning they've reported the field elevation with one millimeter of resolution. Now, one inch is about 25 millimeters, so in essence, they've reported the field elevation to the nearest 0.04 inches, but let's just say the field elevation is around 333 feet above sea level. The ILS to runway 24 starts with a DME arc that's 10 miles from the airport. The initial arc is to be flown at 2,900 feet. After crossing the 044 degree lead radial, an aircraft is authorized to descend to 2,200 feet and to begin turning 90 degrees to the right to join the localizer. Four miles later, at 6 miles DME, the aircraft will intercept the glide slope at 2,200 feet and begin descending. The straight in category C minimums are 520 feet. According to the final report, Flight 812 began the DME arc at an altitude of 10,496 feet, or nearly 7,600 feet higher than published for the arc altitude of 2,900 feet. The report doesn't tell us how high the aircraft was when it turned onto the localizer, but we do know that it had four miles to get down to the 2,200-foot glide slope intercept altitude at 6 DME on the localizer. We do know that at 7.5 DME, the aircraft was still at 5,263 feet, or about 3,000 feet higher than it should be. At about 6 DME, where they should have been intercepting the glide slope, the aircraft was at 4,500 feet, or 2,300 feet high. At 4 DME, when the aircraft should have been at 1,582 feet, it was at 3,205 feet at 160 knots, and descending at 1,000 feet per minute. At 3 DME, the aircraft was at 2,815 feet versus 1,260 feet, and the pilot called out flaps 40 and then landing checklist. The rate of descent was 1,260 feet per minute. 16 seconds later, the first officer called out, it's too high. Two seconds later, the ground prox system called out 2,500, and five seconds later, the first officer said, runway straight down. Two seconds later, the captain said, oh my God, and the autopilot disconnect tone was heard. At this point, the aircraft was at 2 DME and was at 2,220 feet versus 940 feet. The aircraft was at 142 knots indicated and had a descent rate of around 2,000 feet per minute. The first officer asked, go around? And the captain said, wrong loc localizer, which didn't make sense to me when I first read it, as there would only be one localizer going into the airport from this direction. And then a few seconds later, he said, glide path. I had to read this a number of times and finally realized what the captain meant. He said wrong localizer, but then corrected himself, adding the words glide path, when what he really meant was wrong glide slope, or what's more commonly called a false glide slope. So at this point, the captain realized that although the glide slope indicator needle was 
likely centered, he was tracking a false glide slope that was higher than the normal three-degree glide slope. At the time, he said glide path. He'd been awake for 24 minutes, but only just now realized his situation, which was that the aircraft had been too high throughout the entire descent. He couldn't have known that in just 63 seconds, he would crash and die. The ground proximity system said, sink rate. And the first officer once again said, go around. He then said, captain, unstabilized. At this point, the aircraft was at 1,450 feet versus the 625 feet they should have been at on the glide slope. They were also at 154 knots and had an unbelievable descent rate of 4,000 feet per minute. At 682 feet, or about 350 feet above the ground, the aircraft was going 162 knots and still descending at 4,000 feet per minute. The ground proximity system said sink rate a couple of more times before saying pull up. At about this time, the tower said wind calm, runway 24 clear to land, and that's what they did. The aircraft crossed the threshold at about 200 feet AGL with an indicated speed in excess of 160 knots as compared to 50 feet with a target speed of 144 knots for their landing weight. As I said before, the aircraft touched down about 5,200 feet down the runway. A moment or two before touchdown, the first officer said, Go around, Captain, the third time he'd said it. Then the sound of three clicks were heard, and the report speculates that this is the sound of the main gear touching down and the speed brake handle. The first officer says, We don't have runway left. And then a report speculates that the sound heard next is of the nose gear touching down. The captain had selected thrust versers soon after touchdown, and the auto brake selection was at position two, which is not the position for maximum braking. Within six seconds of applying brakes, the captain had initiated a go around in contravention of Boeing standard operating procedures. The aircraft overshot the runway. There is a downward slope from the end of runway 24 toward the boundary fence. After overshooting the runway, the aircraft continued into the runway end safety area soon after the right wing impacted the localizer antenna structure. Thereafter, the aircraft hit the boundary fence and fell into a gorge. Now let's talk about false glide slopes. During the Human Factors course last week, I went up to the whiteboard and talked to the class about antenna design and false glide slopes, as I was guessing that some of the pilots in the room were unfamiliar with them. I've been a ham radio operator since I was a teenager, so I'm a little familiar with antenna designs and their signal characteristics. Let's talk about a Yagi antenna, which is one of the most common forms of a directional antenna. These antennas have a long main boom with a number of wires sticking out of the sides of the boom along the entire length of the antenna. First, let's talk about a localizer antenna, which often has eight of these Yagi antennas mounted side by side at the far end of the runway for which they provide a signal. If we were above the antennas looking down and we could somehow see the antenna radiation pattern, we'd see that the strongest part of the signal, which could be received the farthest distance away, is emanating out down the length of the runway in the direction from which landing aircraft will arrive. And I think I've read that when lined up with the runway, you should be able to receive the localizer signal at least 18 miles away. Still looking from above, we'd see a somewhat weaker signal projected in the opposite direction from landing aircraft. The signal is sometimes used to provide a localizer back course approach to the runway. These back course approaches aren't particularly common, so if you haven't seen one, look up the Merced Regional Airport, which is KMCE, and you'll find a chart for their localizer back course want to approach. These approaches are cheap to implement, as they use the existing signal coming off the back of the same localizer antennas used for the ILS. One characteristic of the back course is that it has reverse sensing, so you may need to configure your avionics for that reversed left-right CDI signal. So our antenna has two main lobes, one big one for aircraft landing on the ILS, and a smaller lobe coming off the back of the antenna. Off to the sides of the antenna, the signal is very weak. You've probably noticed that you often can't receive the localizer signal as you fly by an airport, and that's because relatively little signal comes off the sides of the antenna. If we look down at the main lobe projecting down the runway, we'll see some smaller lobes spaced at regular intervals just off of both sides of that main signal. And these may be as little as 6 or 9 or 12 degrees off the main signal. We'll also see similar, though slightly smaller lobes, 
coming off the backside of the antenna. Now you might be wondering why all of these smaller signal lobes exist. I mean, why don't we just have one main lobe and completely eliminate the weaker signals emanating in other directions? And the answer is, yeah, we'd like to eliminate those side lobes, but unfortunately they are an artifact of the antenna design. Antenna designers do tweak their designs to make these lobes as small as possible, but it's difficult to eliminate them entirely, so we're stuck with them. Now imagine you took the antenna for the localizer, rotated it 90 degrees, and then pointed it up 3 degrees toward the sky. You've now essentially created a glide slope antenna. The glide slope antenna is typically located 750 to 1,250 feet down from the runway threshold, and four to 600 feet from the side of the runway center line. It has a strong main lobe that sends a signal up from the ground, usually at a three degree angle. If we were standing on the runway, looking at the glide slope antenna, and we could somehow see the antenna's radiation pattern, we'd notice that in addition to the main lobe at three degrees, that there were smaller lobes at nine degrees, 15 degrees, and 21 degrees. These lobes at the higher angles produce false glide slopes, and they can fool an aircraft's avionics into tracking these false glide slopes instead of the main signal at 3 degrees. And by the way, glide slope antennas are designed in such a way that there are no false glide slopes below the main 3 degree glide slope. And that's a good thing, as we wouldn't want to accidentally fly a glide slope that was lower than the real one. So how do we avoid flying a false glide slope? Well, by following the procedures for flying an instrument approach. For example, if you are at the proper altitudes for each segment of an instrument approach, you will intercept the glide slope from below the glide slope. So when you fly an ILS approach correctly, you will initially see the glide slope needle or diamond at the top of the scale. And as you approach the final approach fix, it will slowly work its way down toward the center of the indicator. At that point, you can descend along the glide slope. But how do you know for sure that you're on the correct glide slope and not on a false glide slope? I asked the class if they noticed the altitude near the lightning bolt, and one pilot replied, yes, that's how you know when you're at the FAF. Well, that's not quite right. That altitude is there so that you can verify that you are on the correct glide slope as you fly over that point, which is often the FAF for localizer approach. If when you cross that point, you're at an altitude that's perhaps 1,500 feet or more higher than the published altitude, well, then you're on a false glide slope. One of many mistakes made by these pilots was that they didn't get down to 2,200 feet before reaching the glide slope intercept point at about 5.8 DME. And so when they saw the glide slope indicator center, they assumed that they were on the normal glide slope. Unfortunately for them, since they were high, they intercepted a false glide slope and they didn't recognize they were high until about 2 DME. Had they checked at 5.8 DME, as they should have, to verify that they were at approximately 2,200 feet, they would have seen that they were more than 1,000 feet higher and perhaps realized earlier that they were tracking a false glide slope. By the way, I once captured a false glide slope on a VFR flight with a client with rather shocking results. Years ago, we were flying in a Cessna 172 aircraft with round gauges, somewhere in the vicinity of the Livermore, California airport. By total coincidence, on some prior flight, the nav radio had been tuned to the Livermore ILS. We had the autopilot engaged, and unbeknownst to me, the pilot had pushed the APR or approach key on the autopilot. As we were cruising along at about 4,500 feet at about 110 knots, without warning, the aircraft suddenly pitched down sharply and began descending at well over 1,000 feet per minute. I immediately disconnected the autopilot, and the pilot recovered. And I quickly figured out that the reason my calm bliss in cruise flight had been shattered was because all of the right buttons just happened to be pushed to intercept and capture that false glide slope. So whenever you're flying an ILS, make sure that you intercept the glide slope from below the glide slope and that you check the altitude you're at as you cross the FAF and verify that it's relatively close to the crossing altitude published on the chart. And by the way, our nav approaches do not have false glide slopes, which is just one more reason why you might want to choose an our nav approach versus an ILS whenever you have that choice. And just a reminder that I love hearing from you, and I read many of your emails on the show. If you'd like to send me a message, just go out to 
aviationnewstalk.com. Click on contact at the top of the page. That's absolutely the best way to send me a message. And of course, I also want to thank everyone who supports the show in one of the following ways. We love it when you join the club and sign up at aviationnewstalk.com slash support to support the show financially. You can also do that at aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. We also love it when you leave a five-star review on whatever app that you're listening to us on now. And of course, if you're in the market for a headset, please consider buying a Lightspeed headset and using one of the links in our show notes, because if you use those links, they will donate to help support the show. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. And remember that you can always go around. You can-